All right, greetings, greetings, my listeners, throughout time and space. Yes, I am going to conclude, finish up reading this entire book. (laughs) Uh, And uh, it's all being archived on the Rorschach channel, R-O-A-R-S-H-O-C-K, over on uh, YouTube, and uh, plus... I imagine they will remain on the archive-only version of Periscope, which uh, reputedly is going to shut down tomorrow as a uh, as a broadcast platform where we can add new stuff. So many, many hours over many days I've been reading uh, this book, which is Jurgen, A Comedy of Justice by James Branch Cabell which was uh, first published in 1919. And I'm happy about the reading, even with words that I missed or sentences that I transposed when reading late at night with tired eyes. And even when I had trouble uh, pronouncing some some of uh, Cabell's outrageous outrageously difficult to pronounce uh, names of places and characters uh that's fun great book any event i had meant to plow through in my last reading to the end but i was interrupted mid-sentence by a delivery driver he was just doing his job so we're going to jump back a few pages and uh, we're going to see if we can get to the end of this book. Again, it's Jurgen, A Comedy of Justice. The author is James Branch Cabell. And let us get back to this book here with chapter 48. Candid Opinions of Dame Lisa. Eh, sirs observes Cochet the deathless, but some of us are certainly hard to please. And now Jurgen was already intent to shrug off his display of emotion. In selecting a wife, sir, submitted Jurgen, there are all sorts of matters to be considered. Then bewilderment smote him, for it occurred to Jurgen that his previous, previous commerce with these three women was patently unknown to Cochet. Why, Cochet was made, who made all things as they are, Cochet no less, was now doing for Jurgen Cochet's utmost. And that utmost amounted to getting for Jurgen what Jurgen had once with the aid of youth and impudence got for himself. Not even Cochet then could do more for Jurgen than might be accomplished by that youth and impudence and tendency to pry into things generally, which Jurgen had just relinquished as over-restless nuisances. Jurgen drew the inference and shrugged. Decidedly, cleverness was not at the top. However, there was no pressing need to enlighten Cochet and no wisdom in attempting it. For you must understand, sir, continued Jurgen, smoothly, that whatever the first impulse of the moment, that whatever the first impulse of the moment, it was apparent to any reflective person that in the past of each of these ladies, there was much to suggest inborn inaptitude for domestic life. And I am a peace-loving fellow, sir, nor do I hold with moral laxity now that I am 40 odd except of course in talk when it promotes sociability and in verse making where it is esteemed as a conventional ornament still prince the chance I lost I do not refer to matrimony you conceive but in the presence of these famous fair ones now departed from me forever with what glowing words I ought to have spoken upon a wondrous ladder of tropes, metaphors, and recondite allusions, to what stylistic heights of 
Asiatic prose I ought to have ascended. And instead I twaddled like a schoolmaster. Decidedly, Lisa is right, and I am good for nothing. However, you're going to add it, hopefully. It appeared to me that when I last saw her a year ago this evening, Lisa was somewhat less outspoken than usual. Eh, sirs, but she was under a very potent spell. I found that necessary in the interest of law and order hereabouts. I, who made things as they are, am not accustomed to the excesses of practical persons who are ruthlessly bent upon reforming their associates. Indeed, it is one of the advantages of my situation that such folks do not consider things as they are, and in consequence very rarely bother me. And the black gentleman in turn shrugged. You will pardon me, but I notice in my accounts that I am positively committed to color this year's and enemies tonight, and there is a rather large planetary system to be discontinued at half past ten. So time presses, and time inexor is inexorable. P Prince, with all due respect, I fancy it is precisely this truism which you have overlooked. You produce the most charming of women in a determined onslaught of onslaught upon my fancy, but you forget you are displaying them to a man of forty and something. And does that make so great a difference? Oh, a sad difference, Prince, for as a man gets on in life he changes in many ways. He handles sword and lance less creditably and does not carry as heavy a staff as he once flourished. He takes less interest in conversation, and his flow of humor diminishes. He is not the tireless mathematician that he was, if only because his faith in his personal endowments slackens. He recognizes his limitations, and in consequence of unimportance of his opinion. And indeed, he recognizes the probable unimportance of all fleshly matters. So he relinquishes trying to figure out things, and scepters and candles appear to him about equivalent, and he is inclined to give up philosophical experiments and to let things pass unplumbed. Oh, yes, it makes a difference. And Jurgen sighed. And yet, for all that, it is a relief, sir, in a way. Nonetheless, said Cochet. Now that you have inspected the flower of womanhood, I cannot soberly believe you prefer your termagant, termagant of a wife. Frankly, Prince, I also am, as usual, undecided. You may be right in all you have urged, and certainly I cannot go so far as to say you are wrong, but still, at the same time, Come now, could you not let me see my first wife for just a moment? This was no sooner asked than granted, for there, sure enough, was Dame Lisa. She was no longer restricted to quiet speech by any stupendous necromancy. And uncommonly plain she looked after the passing of those lovely ladies. Aha! You rascal, begins Dame Lisa, addressing Jurgen, and so you thought to be rid of me. Oh, a precious lot you are, and a deal of thanks I get for my scrimping and saving and slaving. And she began scolding away. But she began somewhat to Jurgen's astonishment by star starting by stating that he was even worse than the Countess Dorothy. Then he recollected that by not the most disastrous piece of luck conceivable, Dame Lisa's latest news from the outside world had been rendered by her sister, the notary's wife, a twelve month back. And rather unaccountably, Jurgen fell to thinking about 
unsubstantial seemed these curious months devoted to other women as set against the commonplace years which he and Lisa had fretted through together. Of the fine and merry girl that Lisa had been before she married him, of how well she knew his tastes in cookery and all his little preferences and of how cleverly she humored them on those rare days when nothing had occurred to vex her. Of all the buttons she had replaced and all the socks she had darned and of what tempests had been loosed when anyone else had had the audacity to criticize Jurgen, and of how much more unpleasant everything considered life was without her than with her. She was so unattractive looking too, poor dear, that you could not but be sorry for her. And Jurgen's mood was half yearning and half penitence. I think I will take her back, Prince, says Jurgen, very subdued. Now that I am 40 and something, for I do not know, but it is a hard on her, as hard on her as on me. My friend, do not forget the poet that you might be, even yet. No rational person would dispute that the society and amiable chat of Dame Lisa must naturally be a des desideratum. But Dame Lisa was always resentful of long words. Be silent, you black scoffer, and do not allude to such disgraceful things in the presence of respectable people. For I am a decent Christian woman I would have you understand, but everybody knows your reputation and a very fit companion you are for that scamp yonder, and volumes could not say more. Thus casually and with comparative lenience did Dame Lisa dispose of Cochet, who made things as they are, for she believed him to be merely Satan, and to her husband, Dame Lisa now addressed her, herself more particularly. Jurgen, I always told you you would come to this, and now I hope you are satisfied. Jurgen, do not stand there with your mouth open like a scared fish when I ask you a civil question, but answer when you are spoken to. Yes, and you need not try to look so idiotically innocent, Jürgen, because I am disgusted with you. For Jürgen, you heard perfectly well what your, ver your very suitable friend just said about me with my own husband standing by. No, now I beg of you, do not ask me what he said, Jürgen. I leave that to your conscience, and I prefer to talk no more about it. You know that when I am once disappointed in a person, I am through with that person. So very luckily, there is no need at all for you to pile hypocrisy on cowardice. Because if my own husband has not the feelings of a man and cannot protect me from insults and low company, I had best be getting going home and getting supper ready. I dare say the home is like a pigsty. And I can see by looking at you, you have been ruining your eyes by reading in bed again. And to think of your going about in public, even among such associates, with a button off your shirt. She was silent for one terrible moment. Then Lisa spoke in frozen despair. And now I look at that shirt. I ask you fairly, Jurgen. Do you consider that a man of your age has any right to be going about in a shirt that nobody, in a shirt which, in a shirt that I can only, ah, but I never saw such a shirt, and neither did anybody else. You simply cannot imagine what a figure you cut in it, Jurgen. Jurgen, I have been patient with you. I have put up with a great deal, saying nothing where many women would have lost their temper. 
but I simply cannot permit you to select your own clothes, and so ruin the business and take the bread out of our mouths. In short, you are enough to drive a person mad, and I warn you that I am done with you forever. Dame Lisa went with dignity to the door of Cochet's office. So you can come with me or not, precisely as you select. Elect. It is all one to me, I can assure you. After the cruel things you have said and the way you have stormed at me and have encouraged that notorious blackamoor to insult me in terms which I, for one, would not soil my lips by repeating. I do not doubt you consider it is all very clever and amusing, but you know now what I think about it. And upon the whole, if you do not feel the exertion will kill you, you had better come home the long way and stop by sisters and ask her to let you have a half pound of butter. For I know you too well to suppose you have been attending to the churning. Dame Lisa had evinced a stately sort of mirth, such as is unimaginable by bachelors. You're churning while I was away. Oh, no, not you. There is probably not so much as an egg in the house. For my lord and gentleman has had other fish to fry in his fine new courting clothes. And that, and on a man of your age, with a paunch to you like a beer barrel, and with legs like pipe stems. Yes, that infamous shirt of yours is the reason you had better for your own comfort come home the long way. For I warn you, Jurgen, that the style in which I have caught you rigged out has quite decided me before I go home or anywhere else to stop by for a word or so with your high and mighty Madam Dorothy. So you would just as well not be along with me, for there is no pulling wool over my eyes any longer, and you two need never think to hoodwink me again about your goings-on. No, Jürgen, you cannot fool me, for I can read your like, can read you like a book. And such behavior at your time of life does not surprise me at all because it is precisely what I have, what I would have expected of you. With that, Dame Lisa passed through the door and went away still talking. It was of Heitman Michael's wife that the wife of Jürgen spoke, discoursing of all personal traits and of the past doings and what and with augmented fervor of the figure and visage of Madame Dorothy, and all these abominations appeared to the eye of discernment and must be revealed by the tongue of candor as a matter of public duty. So passed Dame Lisa, neither as flame nor mist, but as the voice of judgment. In chapter 49 of The Compromise with Cochet. Phew, said Cochet in the ensuing silence. You had better stay overnight in any event. I really think, friend, you will be more comfortable just now, at least, in this quiet cave. But Jürgen had taken up his hat. No, I dare say I too had better be going, says Jürgen. I thank you very heartily for your in intended kindness, sir. Still, I do not know, but it is better as it is. And is there anything, Jürgen <coughs> coughed delicately, is there anything to pay, sir? Oh, just a trifle, first of all, for a year's maintenance of Dame Lisa. You see, Jürgen... This is an almighty fine shirt you are wearing. It rather appeals to me, and I fancy from something your wife let drop just now, it did not impress her as 
being quite suited to you. So, in the interest of domesticity, suppose you ransom Dame Lisa with that fine shirt of yours. Why, willingly, said Jurgen, and he took off the shirt of Nessus. You have worn this for some time, I understand, said Cochet meditatively. And did you ever notice any inconvenience in wearing this garment? <clears throat> Not that I could detect, Prince. It fitted me and seemed to impress everybody most favorably. There, said Cochet, that is what I have always contended. To the strong man, to wholesome matter-of-fact people generally, it is a fatal irritant. But persons like you can wear the shirt of Nessus very comfortably for a long, long while and be generally admired, and you end by exchanging it for your wife's society. But now, Jurgen, about yourself. You probably noticed that my door was marked Keep Out. One must have rules, you know. Often it is a nuisance, but still rules are rules. And so I must tell you, Jurgen, it is not permitted any person to leave my presence unmaimed, if not actually annihilated. One really must have rules, you know. You could chop off an arm or a hand or a whole finger. Come now, Prince, you must be joking. Cochet the Deathless was very grave as he sat there in meditation, drumming with his long jet black fingers upon the tabletop that was curiously inlaid with 30 pieces of silver. In the lamplight, his sharp nails glittered like flame points and the color suddenly withdrew from his eyes so that they showed like small white eggs. But, man, how strange you are, said Cochet presently, and life flowed back into his eyes, and Jurgen ventured the liberty of breathing. Inside, I mean, why, there is hardly anything left. Now, rules are rules, of course, but you, are the, who are the remnant of a poet, may depart unhindered whenever you will, and I shall take nothing from you, for really it is necessary to draw the line somewhere. Jurgen meditated this clemency, and with a sick heart, he seemed to understand. Yes, that is probably the truth, for I have not retained the faith, nor the desire, nor the vision. Yes, that is probably the truth. Well, at all events, Prince, I very unfaintedly admired each of the ladies to whom you were friendly enough to present me, and I was greatly flattered by those, their offers. More than generous, I thought them, but it really would not do for me to take up with any of these, of them now, for Lisa is my wife, you see. A great deal has passed between us, sir, in the last ten years. And I have been a sore disappointment to her in many ways. And I am used to her. Then Jurgen considered and regarded the black gentleman with mingled envy and commiseration. Well, I know you probably would not understand, sir, on account of your not being, I suppose, a married person. But I can assure you it is always pretty much like that. <clears throat> I lack grounds to dispute your aphorism, observed Cochet, inasmuch as matrimony was certainly not included in my doom. Nonetheless, to a bystander, the conduct of you both appears remarkable. I could not understand, for example, just how your wife proposed to have you keep out of her sight forever and still have supper with you tonight, nor why she should desire to sup with such a reprobate as she described with unbridled pungency and disapproval. <clears throat> ah, but again, it is always pretty much like that, sir. And the truth of it, Prince, is a great symbol. The truth of it is, we have lived together so long that my wife has become rather foolishly fond of me. So she is not, as one might say, 
quite reasonable about me. No, sir, it is the fashion of women to discard civility toward those for whom they suffer most willingly. And when whom a woman loveth, she chastised, she chasteneth after a good proceedeth. <clears throat> precedent. <laughs> and whom a woman loveth, she chasteneth after a good precedent. There we are. By her talking, Jurgen has nowhere any precedent. Why, it, fe it deafens, it appalls, it submerges you in an uproarious sea of fault finding. And in a word, you might as profitably oppose a hurricane. Yet you want her back. Now, assuredly, Jurgen, I do not think very highly of your wisdom, but by your bravery, I am astounded. Ah, Prince, it is because I can perceive that all women are poets through the medium they work in is not always ink. So the moment Lisa is not is set free from what, in a manner of speaking, sir, inconsiderate persons might in their unthinking way refer to as the terrors of an underground establishment that I do not for an instant doubt to be conducted after a system which furthers the true interests of everybody and so reflects vast credit upon its officials if you'll pardon my frankness. <clears throat> and Jurgen smiled ingratiatingly. Why, at that moment, Lisa's thoughts take form in very much the high denunciatory style of Jeremiah and Amos, who were remarkable and fine poets. Her concluding observations as to the Countess in particular I consider to have been an example of sustained invective such as one rarely encounters in this degenerate age. <clears throat> well, her next essay in creative composition is My Supper, which will be an equally spirited impromptu. Tomorrow she will darn and sew me an epic, and her desserts will continue to be in the richest lyric vein. <clears throat> Such, sir, are the poems of Lisa, all addressed to me, who came so near to gallivanting with mere queens. What can it be that you are remorseful, said Cochet? Oh, Prince, when I consider steadfastly the depth and the intensity of that devotion which for so many years she tended me and has endured the society of that person whom I peculiarly knew to be the most tedious and irritating of companions. I stand aghast before a miracle and I cry, oh, certainly a, a goddess. And I can think of no queen who is fairly mentionable in the same breath. Ha! All we poets write a deal about love, but none of us may grasp the world's full meaning until he reflects that this is a passion mighty enough to induce a woman to put up with him. <coughs> ah. Ah. Whew. Even so, it does not seem to induce quite thorough confidence. Jürgen, I was grieved to see that Dame Lisa evidently suspects you of running after some other women in your wife's absence. Think upon that now. And you saw for yourself how little the handsomest of women could tempt me. Yet even Lisa's observed notion I can comprehend and pardon. And again... You probably would not understand my overlooking such a thing, sir, on account 
of your not being a married person. Nevertheless, my forgiveness also is a great symbol. Then Jürgen sighed, and he shook hands very circumspectly with Gaucher, who made things as they are, and Jürgen started out of the office. But I will bear you company a part of the way, says Cochet. So Cochet removed his dressing gown, and he put on the fine laced coat, which was hung over the back of a strange-looking chair with three legs, each of a different metal. The shirt of Nessus Cochet folded and put aside, saying that someday he might be able to use it somehow. And Cochet paused before the blackboard, and he scratched his head reflectively. Jürgen saw that this board was nearly covered with figures which had not yet been added up, and this blackboard seemed to him the most frightful thing he had faced anywhere. Then Cochet came out of the cave with Jürgen, and Cochet walked with Jürgen across Amnoran Heath, and through Morvan in the late evening. And Cochet talked as he, they went, and a queer thing Jürgen noticed, and it was that the moon was sinking in the east, as though the time were getting earlier and earlier. But Jürgen did not presume to criticize this in the presence of Cochet, who made things as they are. And I manage affairs at its best I can, Jürgen, but they get in a fright, fearful muddle sometimes. Eh, sirs, I have no competent assistance. I have to look out for everything, absolutely everything. And of course, every... And of course, while in a sort of way I am infallible, mistakes will occur every now and then in the actual working out of plans that in the absence, that in the abstract are right enough. So it really does please me to hear anybody putting in a kind word for things as they are, because between ourselves, there is a deal of dissatisfaction about. And I am honestly delighted just now to hear you speaking up for evil in the fact of that rapscallion monk so I give you thanks and many thanks Jürgen for your kind word just now thanks Jürgen <clears throat> he perceived that they had passed the Cistercian Abbey and were approaching Bellegarde and it was as in a dream <clears throat> that Jürgen was speaking. Who are you, and why do you thank me? asks Jürgen. My name is no great matter, but you have a kind heart, Jürgen. May your life be free from care. S save us from hurt and harm, friend, but I am already married. Then resolutely, Jürgen put aside the spell that was befogging him. See here, Prince, are you beginning all over again? For I really cannot stand any more of your benevolences. Cochet smiled. No, Jürgen, I am not beginning all over again. For now I have never begun. And now there is no word of truth in anything which you remember of the year that just passed. Now none of these things has ever happened. But how can that be, Prince? Why should I tell you, Jürgen? Let it suffice that what I will not only happens, but has already happened. Beyond the ancientest memory of man and his mother. How otherwise could I be Cochet? And so farewell to you, poor Jürgen, to whom nothing in particular has happened now. It is not justice I am giving you, 
but something infinitely more acceptable to you and all your kind. But to be sure, says Jurgen, I fancy that nobody anywhere cares much for justice. So farewell to you, Prince. And at our parting, I ask no more questions of you, for I perceive it is scant comfort a man gets from questioning Cochet, who made things as they are. But I am wondering what pleasure you get out of it all. Eh, sirs, says Cochet, with not the most candid of smiles. I contemplate the spectacle with appropriate emotions. And so speaking, Cochet quitted Jurgen forever. Yet how may I be sure, thought Jurgen instantly, that this black gentleman was really Cochet? He said he was. Why, yes. And Hervendil, to all interest, told me that Hervendil was Cochet. Aha! And what else did Hervendil say? This is one of the romancer's most venerable devices that is being practiced. Why, but there was Smoit of Glathion also, to, so that this is the third time I have been fobbed off with the explanation I was dreaming and left with no proof one way or the other. Thus Jurgen indignantly And then he laughed. Why, but of course I may have talked face to face with Cochet, who made all things as they are, and again, I may not have. That is the whole point of it. The cream, as one might say, of the jest, that I cannot ever be sure. Well, and Jurgen shrugged here, well, and what could, I, what could I be expected to do about it? Chapter 50. The moment that did not count. And that is really all the story, save for the moment Jurgen paused on his way home. For Cochet, if it indeed was Cochet, had quitted Jurgen just as they approached Valagard. And as the pawnbroker walked on alone in the pleasant April evening, one called to him from the terrace. Even in the dusk, he knew that was the Countess Dorothy. May I speak with you a moment, says she. Very willingly, madam, and Jurgen ascended from the highway to the terrace. I thought it would be n near your supper hour, so I was waiting here until you passed. You conceive it is not quite convenient for me to seek you out at the shop. Why, no, madam, there is a prejudice, said Jurgen soberly, and he waited. He saw that Madame Dorothy was perfectly composed, yet anxious to speed the affair. You must know, she said, that my husband's birthday approaches, and I wish to surprise him with a gift. It is therefore necessary that I raise some money without troubling him. How much abominable usurer could you advance me upon this necklace? Jurgen turned it in his hand. It was a handsome piece of jewelry, familiar to him as formerly the property of Heitman Michael's mother. Jurgen named a sum. But, but that, the Countess says, is not a fraction of its worth. Times are very hard, madam. Of course, if you cared to sell outright, I could deal more generously. Old monster, I could not do that. 
It would not be convenient, she has hesitated here. It would not be explicable. As to that, madam, I could make you an imitation in paste which nobody could distinguish from the original. I can amply understand that you desire to veil from your husband any sacrifices that are entailed by your affection. It is not my affection for him, said the countess quickly. I alluded to your affection for him, said Jurgen, naturally. Then Countess Dorothy named a price for the necklace. For it is necessary, I have that much, and not a penny less. And Jurgen shook his head dubiously and vowed that ladies were unconscionable bargainers. And Jurgen agreed to what she asked because the necklace was worth almost as much again. Then Jurgen suggested that the business could be most conveniently concluded through an emissary. If Monsieur de Neret, for example, could have matters explained to him and could manage to visit me tomorrow, I am sure we could carry through this amiable imposture without any annoyance whatever to Heitman Michael, says Jurgen smoothly. Nere will come then, says the Countess, and you may give him the money precisely as though it were for me, for him. But certainly, madam, a very estimable young nobleman, that, and it, it is a pity his debts are so large. I heard that he had lost heavily at cards within the last month, and I grieved, madam. He has promised me, when these debts are settled, to play no more. But again, what am I saying? I mean, master inquisitive, that I take considerable interest in the welfare of Monsieur de Narac, and so I have sometimes chided him on his wild courses, and that is all I mean. Precisely, madam. And so Monsieur de Nirac will come to me tomorrow for the money, and there is no more to say. Jurgen paused. The moon was risen now. These two sat together upon a bench of carved stone near the balustrade, and before them upon the other side of the highway were luminous valleys and treetops. Fleetingly, Jurgen recollected the boy and girl who had once sat in this place and had talked of all the splendid things where Jurgen was to do, which Jurgen was to do, and of the happy life that was to be theirs together. Then he regarded the composed and handsome woman beside him, and he considered that the money to pay her latest lover's debts had been assured with a suitable respect for appearances. Come, but this is a gallant lady who would defy the almanac, reflected Jurgen. Even so, 38 is an undeniable and somewhat autumnal figure, and I suspect young Nurak is bleeding his elderly mistress. Well, but at his age, nobody has a conscience. Yes, and Madame Dorothy is handsome still, and still my pulse is playing me queer tricks because she is near me, and my voice is not the intonation I intend because she is near me, and still I am three quarters in love with her. Yes, in the light of such cursed folly as even now possesses me. I have good reason to give thanks for the regained infirmities of age, yet living seems to me a wasteful and inequitable process, for this is a poor outcome 
for the boy and girl that I remember. In weighing this outcome, I am tempted to weep and to talk romantically, even now. But he did not. For really, weeping was not requisite. Yerkin was making his fair profit out of the Countess's folly, and it was merely his duty to see that this little business transaction was managed without any scandal. So there is nothing more to say, observed Jurgen, as he rose in the moonlight, save that I shall always be, delight be delighted to serve you, madam, and I may reasonably boast that I have earned a reputation for fair dealing. And he thought, in effect, since certainly as she grows older, she will need yet more money for her lovers. I am offering to pimp for her. Then Jurgen shrugged. That is one side of the affair. The other is that I transact my legitimate business. I, who am that which the years have made of me. Thus it was that Jurgen quitted the Countess Dorothy, whom, as you have heard, the pawnbroker had loved in his first youth under the name of Heart's Desire, and whom in the youth that was loaned him by Mother Sereda he had loved as Queen Helen, the delight of gods and men. For Jurgen was quitting Madame Dorothy after the simplest of business transactions, which consumed only a moment and did not actually count one way or the other. And after this moment, which did not count, the pawnbroker resumed his journey, and so came presently to his home. He peeped through the window, and there in a snug room with supper laid sat Dame Lisa about some sewing and evidently in a quite amiable frame of mind. Then terror smote the Jurgen who had faced sorcerers and gods and devils intrepidly, for I forgot about the butter. But immediately afterward he recollected that now not even what Lisa had said to him in the cave was real. Neither he nor Lisa now had ever been in the cave, and probably there was no longer any such place, and now there never had been any such place. It was rather confusing. Ah, but I must remember carefully, said Jurgen that I have not seen Lisa since breakfast this morning. Nothing whatever has happened. There has been no requirement laid upon me, after all, to do the manly thing, so I retain my wife, such as she is, poor dear. I retain my home. I retain my shop and a fire, fair line of business. Yes, Cochet, it, if it was really Cochet, has dealt with me very justly, and probably his methods are everything they should be. Certainly I cannot go so far as to say that they are wrong, but still, at the same time. Then Jurgen sighed and entered his snug home. Thus it was in the old days. And that is the end of Jurgen, A Comedy of Justice by James Branch Cabell. And uh, I hope you, whoever's listening, I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly have enjoyed reading it. And uh, sometime I'll go back and listen to it again with all the coughs and hiccups and and uh, all that kind of stuff. And see if I can figure out how to pronounce his silly names. In any event, uh, I bid you all farewell and farewell Periscope. And I will see you on YouTube and Haps and Twitter and Facebook and all over the social web. And of course, uh, take a look at my 
personal website, uh, Rorschach.net. Thank you so much. Goodbye.